you, Stefan, for the for the introduction. Um, some of you guys might know me. Um, you know, I, I think we've done a few programs in the past uh, for FMPS, but uh, yeah, uh, over the past couple of years, it's been a pretty uh, fun culinary journey uh, for me and and Hillary, who sadly cannot be here. Um, she started her yearly vacation, um, so she's going to be off canning her jellies and and harvesting her her foods and doing whatnot. But um, I wanted to uh, to give everyone a um, give everyone a little show of, of kind of what we've compiled over the years um, in, uh, in our native edible uh, escapades. Um, so uh, typically the way we would do um, our programs is in person. Of course, we can't really do that, um, the current state of things. Um, and, and what we would do is we would usually have some kind of, of snack or some kind of, uh, or actually add like a live cooking element to it. So um, I really tried to, to double down on the kinds of plants I can talk about and also some really good um, like recipe ideas and how to use these plants. Um, so uh, from humble beginnings, uh, way back when, I don't know if anyone remembers Wilcox's uh, Spring Eco Fest, uh, that was back in April, 2018. Um, me and Hillary set up a little tiny table in the way back of the nursery. We did a little program talking about some of the native edibles that we were carrying at the time. And um, we made a couple of samples, let everyone try them. And that kind of like sparked the interest in us to really like buckle down, see what we could use um, and kind of push it to the limit. Um, so that little success got us invited to the, um, the Fans Native Plant Show. We spoke in front of a bigger crowd, much more nerve wracking. Um, and I'm pretty sure that was uh, the first time that I'd introduced uh, that crowd of people to bird peppers and how spicy they really are. And I lit, I think everyone's mouth on fire. Um, but it was a great experience for us. And that, that success um, spawned the, the first iteration of our cooking with native plants program, where if you can see the picture, I kind of set up a mock kitchen, um, had all of my equipment and did a, a, a cook through of um, some, uh, I believe it was like chicken tacos or something like that. Um, so, you know, showcasing the plants, um, I had Hillary by my side, she would, uh, she would talk through um, all the different uses, how to grow the plants, um, when to harvest, all that stuff, um, while I went through and, and did the actual cooking. Um, uh, we then did it in front of a much larger crowd, much more nerve wracking crowd in, uh, in front of the, uh, the uh, Pinellas Extension service, which was really cool. We got to do a little like, uh, it was early in the morning. So we did a little breakfast menu uh, of some, uh, some scrambled eggs, um, elderflower pancakes and some other cool stuff. Um, so it, there's definitely been no shortage of uh, ways for us to express ourselves with the native plants. Um, it's definitely been something we've kind of developed a passion for. So uh, the whole kind of idea is, you know, it, it, it all ties back into the main idea of why you would plant natives in your yard. You know, you, you want to support ecosystems, you want to support sustainability, and you want to, you know, be able to provide for wildlife. But, you know, we kind of are definitely good on that message and we want to kind of push the envelope a little bit and see what, uh, what more they can do. Um, so um, the other benefit really is that these are not widely cultivated or at all cultivated um, plants as far as their culinary uses. So they're you know new flavors that you might not be familiar with. Um, you know when you're when you're going around and testing these new things, uh, it kind of opens up a world of of new applications because it's not you know it's not the basil you're used to, it's not the different herbs you're used to, um, or even vegetables. So it kind of gave us a lot more room to play with when we would try to. Um, when we try to create these dishes. Um, and everyone knows that, you know, generally uh, a lot of these plants uh, in a landscape setting um, or even in, you know, some container gardenings, um, they're going to be a little bit easier to care for um, than, uh, you know, different uh, herbs or vegetables. You may, you know, you may not have to deal with uh, pests as much because you've got a native yard, you've got um, beneficial insects, things that are going to uh, take care of those problems for you. Um, so, you know, and that kind of the same idea is that you can put these plants in a pot like myself. Um, I live in an apartment. Um, I've got a little tiny patio. So I'm growing what I can, but even then I can still grow stuff um, and, and still have stuff to, uh, to pull from um, when I need. But also, you know, it, it's a great opportunity to uh, get another benefit out of the plants that are in your yard that you're already landscaping with. You're getting them for other uses. Um, it's just something that, you know, 
you got to point people towards and say, hey, look, you know, this plant is great, but, you know, did you ever think about pulling a cocoa plum off and eating it or, or, or making a cake out of it or, you know, uh, things like that. So um, uh, what I want to do first is kind of go through my, my list of favorites. Um, these are the ones that we've had the best, the most success with um, and things that are also pretty relevant uh, during this time of the year. And then um, towards the end, I'll go through um, some of the, uh, some of the uh, recipes that we've successfully created and kind of give you an idea as to how you can uh, incorporate these plants and these flavors um, you know, into your next dish. So everyone knows this plant, the, uh, the beautyberry, Calicarpa americana. Um, it's a great plant. It's a great wildlife plant to provide for pollinators. Um, you know, it's got that nice um, bright purple berry uh, in the summer. Uh, and it's also got that, you know, nice fragrant, um, nice fragrant leaf, use it for, you know, insect repellent, you know, whatever. Some people really like the smell, kind of like a perfume. Um, but this one's great. Um, the berries, uh, when you, especially when you cook them down, you know, they're small but mighty. So when you throw them in a big pot, um, cover them with water, boil them out, and then you can start adding like sugars and pectin, make jams or jellies. Um, it's got a very like floral flavor. Um, and, and when you can add, of course, a whole bunch of sugar, um, it can really bring out that that nice floral note, and it you know, uh, Hillary always says uh, whenever she cooks it, it just perfumes up her her home. It's got this wonderful fragrance, um, and you know, it's not a flavor that you, you see on the shelves at the at the supermarket. It's something that you can you know feel very special about that you're you're making it your own, and that it's it's a very exclusive kind of flavor. Um, and uh, I've got examples of of what we've used. I think all of these plants for um, in here, so. Um, you know, that's a pretty common one. I think we all know about that. Um, the next one uh, that I've got is uh, a wild basil. That's um, Osimum compechianum. It's a uh, South Florida species. Um, uh, we've seemed to do pretty well with growing it up here. Um, not too many problems keeping it alive. It's just that uh, we tend to sell out um, of the plant before we can really um, understand that, you know, that was our last one. So then we kind of scour around the nursery, try and find seedlings. Um, we have a hard time keeping track of, of mother plants and, and so that we can keep production up. But um, this is a plant that um, certainly uh, has different sort of basil flavor to it. Um, it's a lot less earthy. It's, it's kind of more uh, along the, the lines of a straight mint. Um, but it does have, it does have kind of those like basil-y overtones. It, it's more in line with like a, a Thai basil um, with just a little bit more mint in it. But it's got a really nice flavor, um, really good to use for like um, savory dishes, um, uh, like uh, Asian cooking. Uh, it's really, I, I found some pretty good use um, in, that, uh, in that realm. And it, it's a fairly easy plant. It only grows to about like two to three feet tall. Um, like sun and once it's established it's pretty drought tolerant um, so that's one of our favorites to use for um, you know as an herbaceous an herbaceous plant so in in spreads like fresh herb spreads um, or used for flavorings of teas and stuff like that that's kind of what we've done um, with that um, another one that you're probably familiar with dotted horse mint is another great plant it's an absolute monster when it comes to um, pollinator plants. This thing is fantastic. It's got a beautifully intricate flower. And, you know, as this thing grows, it, it can develop into a pretty sizable plant, like three feet by three feet. Um, it is an annual, so you may have to, um, you know, just wait for it to pop back up from seed in the spring. Um, but this is a plant um, that's very similar in like composition to an oregano. It's got a lot of thymol in it. It's It's kind of got that um, that kind of mintiness too. Um, now this is one of those plants that's extremely potent. So um, if you were to go out and use this, if your recipe calls for like a tablespoon of oregano um, and make sure it's fresh oregano, not dried oregano because dried ones have kind of lost a little bit of the, they kind of lost, lost a little bit of their um, intensity. Um, this is something you would want to cut like in half. Um, you know, only use half of uh, the required amount um, if, you're, if you're substituting for the horse mint. Um, but this stuff makes great like herbal teas along with the, the basil, um, really, really good, um, easy to grow, uh, uh, plant for that. Um, bird pepper is another one I mentioned at the, uh, the fan show. I kind of singed everyone's tongues a little bit. Um, cause at that moment I really didn't understand just how hot these things were. Um, so you kind of have to like, uh, temper your expectations when you're, when you're putting it into a dish. Um, 
I would call it uh, a little bit hotter than like jalapenos. So, you know, uh, and the fact is, is that they're smaller peppers. So if you're, you're processing them or you're cutting them you know, up or something like that, chances are you're, you're chopping up seeds and you're getting all the spice that this thing has to offer, which, you know, if you're using it as that kind of a vessel, you're using it um, as a way to get a little bit of pepper flavor, but some heat into your dish, then, um, you know, this thing is great for that. Um, this is also a plant that, uh, you know, is considered an annual. So save some seeds uh, for the next year. This thing produces, like the picture shows, a whole lot of peppers, um, grows to about three to four feet tall. And this is something that, you know, everyone uses peppers and everything. You can throw it in salsas, you can um, uh, do chimichurris, which is great. It's kind of like an olive oil based um, like a pepper marinade or sauce. Um, and I've done that before to great success. Um, the first time I took this stuff home and I tried out cooking with it, um, I had blended up, uh, you know, some of the herbs, uh, peppers and some olive oil in a blender and you would marinate like a steak in it. Um, and then just throw that on uh, like cast iron or, or stainless steel, cook it through. And then if you had any like residual um, uh, sauce that you would left aside, you could top it with that. But um, I didn't realize how hot they would be and just how exposed all that capsaicin inside of it would be. So the first time I threw it on a, on a hot cast iron, it basically just like bombed my apartment and you know the smoke detectors went off we were all like breathing in straight kept like aerosolized capsaicin and it was just a, a headache and my roommate came out and he was so confused and uh so anyways uh, i guess the lesson is that they're hot they're delicious but uh make sure you're using the proper amounts and and the thing is with all of the stuff that i've done i um, I got kind of lazy. Um, you know, I don't have recipes for a lot of these things. Um, my approach to cooking is like an amateur cook is that um, once you kind of understand flavor profiles and you kind of understand, um, you know, basic uh, like seasoning techniques and stuff like that, um, I don't really use uh, like standard recipes. So a lot of this stuff I kind of do by feel, you know, once I've got a, a, a taste for how hot these things are or what kind of a flavor the uh, wild basil has or something like that. It just kind of makes its way into the dish. So I've gotten a lot of, of requests from people that ask like, oh, do you have recipes? Can you, can you give me a recipe for this stuff? And I'm like, well, you know, I, I don't really because I just kind of cooked with it. But um, so anyway, so it's, it's kind of like an as you feel it out, as you kind of experience it, you, you, you're able to, to understand it and use these um, plants. Um, so the next one is uh, meadow garlic. Uh, this is Allium canadensa. And, and this one is uh, a little tiny um, annual garlic um, or, or onion, I should say. It's called meadow garlic, but it's really just an onion. Uh, and so um, you can use the greens just like you would chives, um, you know, cut them off, pinch them off, chop them up, throw them into like an omelet or, you know, to give you that fresh oniony flavor. Um, or uh, once they start going dormant, once the, the, the leaves start dying back, you can um, harvest the bulbs. And they're little tiny pearl onions. They're about the size of a quarter. Um, you know, you can get plenty of them. They definitely produce quite a bit if you've got, um, you know, a, a number of plants. Um, they're great for pickling. Um, you can chop them up and use them as is. Um, uh, Hillary, I'm sure, will be doing a whole lot of that um, during her vacation. She's got all of these plants uh, in her raised beds, uh, and this is about the time of year that she's doing that. So I don't have any pictures of, of these things being uh, pickled or processed or, or anything like that, but um, once we get further into it, um, we can kind of go over um, how to process these things as well. Um, and, and these being an annual and, a, and a, an onion or a garlic, um, once the flowers are done and the, um, the heads have started to set, that's going to be um, your set for the next year. So you'd save that, plant it out, and then, you know, regrow your onions from that. Um, so the next plant we kind of came across, and this was kind of a fun story, um, is creeping cucumber, uh, Molothria pendula. Um, it is a widespread annual pretty much all over the state, I think in every single county. Um, and this one we came across, you know, it's not widely cultivated or, or available from any wholesale growers. Um, my mom, a few years ago, had asked me to come by the house and 
do some maintenance around the place. And she said, Davis, there's a vine that's growing on the AC unit. Can you just get that off? And, and the, you know, that was the one time I had ever been by to do any sort of landscaping at my parents' house. And I pulled it off, kind of noticed as I crushed it up that it smelled like cucumber. So I, I took a sample, took a couple pictures, brought it in um, into the store and I deed it. And turns out that it's it's a member of the cucumber family, a Malothria. So um, we grew it out. Um, we grew it out and found out that, yeah, they do produce little tiny um, green cucumbers. They're about the size of your pinky nail. Um, and uh, these vines are incredibly prolific. Um, you know, they're, they can grow six, eight feet on a trellis. Um, and uh, later on in the summer, they'll produce a whole bunch of these little tiny cucumbers. And they're, you know, they're great to eat out of hand if you want. Um, we saved enough to make a few jars of little tiny, like bite-sized uh, pickles, which were fantastic. Um, so this is a really cool kind of plant that we discovered uh, and a great one to, to add to little salads, um, little tiny cucumbers, or, or like I said, the pickling is great. Um, and I've got a great use for this um, that I came up with uh, a little bit later in the, uh, a little bit later in the program. Um, so elderberry, I'm sure, is something that everyone's familiar with uh, as well. Um, it's pretty versatile in its um, uses culinarily. Um, I'm sure people know of elderflower this or that, you know, liqueur or, or um, like lemonade they sell to. Um, and also the berries that come after are, are you know, have really good um, like antioxidants and like medicinal qualities. So those are pretty widely used. Um, but we've done some experiments with this because we've got a pretty sizable shrub um, on the property. This is something that definitely if you've got in your landscape, you've got moisture and you've got a lot of space because it does get big and it likes to drink. So, um, you know, it's something that we've experimented with as well. Um, and you do have to be careful because I think pretty much everything except for the flowers and the fruit are toxic. So you want to make sure that you're processing it very carefully. Um, uh, I do have pictures of, uh, of Hillary, you know, kind of cutting all the, uh, the heads off with scissors, you know, and picking them off and, and doing that sort of thing. Um, but the, the flowers are wonderfully fragrant. Um, when you steep them in with uh, like a, a simple syrup solution um, over uh, a day or two, they make great um, syrups, really floral, very, very wonderful syrups. And also the berries have a, a wonderful um, kind of like earthy tang uh, to them that makes great, uh, you know, syrups, jellies, um, or, uh, or what have you. Uh, Davis, can you actually make a tea with the berries? On the elderberry? Yeah, there was a question actually, I mean, I've, I've tried it before, but from your experience, have you actually made tea not with the flowers, but like actual, the actual berries? I haven't. Um, I imagine it's probably, you know, it's, it's probably fairly good. I think once you boil any of these sort of berry type um, harvests down, you'll kind of uh, break it down. You'll let all that, all that good stuff from inside the berry kind of seep into the water. And yeah, it probably makes a pretty nice tea. Okay. So, but pretty much someone was saying you're not just eating the flowers. Um, the leaves, I don't know about any kind of medicinal use of the leaves or any culinary use of the actual leaves. No, no. And, and I'm pretty sure those are toxic. So I, I would, anything, uh, the stems, the leaves, um, parts of the bark, roots, any of that stuff, anything but the flower or berry, stay away from because they, they can contain those toxins. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so the next one, I think, uh, was, a, uh, was a donation by uh, uh, that man that has just spoken, uh, Stefan Babiak. Um, uh, actually, I think it was Mallory that uh, donated these, but this is Florida Betany, Stachys Floridana. Um, it is a uh, very, very aggressive wildflower. Um, only grows to about a foot or two tall, has these cute little like pinkish white flowers on it. Um, and these things, um, you know, as the, the, the genus might give away, is that these things have a starchy tuber. So, um, uh, they kind of look like maggots. They're kind of gross. Um, Hillary always joked about um, freaking out her her daughter or uh, her daughter's kids uh, by putting these in like a Halloween salad, her maggots with her eye of newt, um, uh, malothrias and, and all of these other like orange and you know purple carrots and stuff like that. Um, 
So these plants grow all over the place. They grow incredibly aggressively. So, uh, you know, you do have to watch out if you're going to grow this plant. Um, and the way that you harvest it is um, once uh, the heat really kicks up, these things kind of go dormant and they're going to start reserving the energy in the tubers for um, when cooler weather comes, they're going to they're gonna sprout back out. So that's when you're going to want to harvest these things when all that energy has gone back into the root. Um, and these things are kind of, um, they, they're, they're kind of similar to like water chestnuts. Um, they've got that wonderful like watery crunch, um, a little bit of like radish flavor. So they're great for pickling. Um, I actually use these as, uh, as a partial base for um, some veggie burgers that I made uh, a few years ago um, for another garden club, um, kind of as like a binding agent. Um, and it worked really well. Um, you could also shred these into like a fine shred. And I've thought of doing like uh, potato pancakes or something like that with them because um, they've kind of got that, um, that sort of thing going on. They're also just great to eat out of hand. They taste really fresh, really clean. Um, they just uh, look a little funky. Um, so it's kind of fun to freak people out with them. Um, and uh, to my point, uh, Hillary, when we were first kind of uh, introducing this and growing in with this plant, uh, this bed used to have, I'm pretty sure, uh, one section uh, in the back right corner that had Physalis, our, our ground cherry. We were also experimenting with that, um, the tomatillo. Uh, and a few other things in the bed, but otherwise it was completely clear. And she planted a little bit of betony in it and it just ate the bed. Uh, so you do want to be careful if you've got this, that you kind of confine it to a pot and that you're able to uh, harvest it and keep it under control. Um, I wouldn't necessarily, uh, uh, I wouldn't plant this as a, a landscape plant, like a ground cover or anything like that, unless you, uh, you know, you really liked it, you really liked harvesting these things, or you really liked, uh, you know, the look of the, uh, the ground cover, because it certainly isn't going away anytime soon. Um, but this is one that we've had great success with. It's got a lot of versatility for those tubers, um, and definitely one of our favorites. Um, the next thing, everyone knows sea grapes. Um, you know, I haven't heard a lot of people actually doing anything with the grapes that they produce. They're very sweet um, when you get them when they're ripe. Um, and they definitely, if you can find, you know, older, older specimens, uh, produce enough that you can just go out there for half an hour, pick a whole bunch of fruit off and have jars and jars that you can do jellies with. Um, you can bake cakes with it, um, you know, or, or just sit on the couch and snack um, because they are absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, and some people, especially, you know, in our area around the coast are, are planting sea grapes on their properties. So it's definitely something that if you're look, you know, if you've got this plant uh, to use, because, uh, you know, once, once you allow these plants to get so big, they, they produce an incredible amount of fruit. And it's definitely something that's got a lot of allure too, just because of, uh, of that fact. Um, and cocoa plums. Uh, we've had a, a little bit, this is one that, that has definitely taken some time for us to, to come around to, to how we use it and uh, like recommending it to people. Um, this is another one of our coastal plants. Um, pretty popular. Um, the horizontal variety uh, is uh, for its kind of low growing form um, as kind of a, a lining hedge or, or what have you. Um, so uh, the, the two primarily ones that we use are the horizontal variety that produce this kind of like whitish uh, off-white or like uh, peach colored uh, fruit. And then there's the red tip cocoa plum. That's more of your upright grower, um, can reach that height much quicker um, and produces kind of like a blackish um, fruit on it. Um, both of them, when they're mature, when they're ripe, um, do have like a, a very noticeable sweetness to it. Um, we found that the red tip cocoa plums generally have a little bit more of like a fruit flavor to them, kind of, kind of like a mild apple. So we definitely recommend uh, using that specific uh, uh, variety. Um, but either one of them, you know, these are great out of hand. You know, if I'm ever walking to the back of the nursery, you've got a few shrubs planted, I'll pick one off and eat them because they taste great. Um, and actually the seeds inside of them um, can be roasted um, and, uh, and eaten as kind of like a roasted uh, nut. And it, you know, it's got a, a wonderful flavor. Um, and you'll see that uh, the one time uh, that we got enough cocoa plums to make one of our recipes that we've been waiting on. Uh, you know, it was, it was kind of a, a waste, not want not. So we used every single part of the cocoa plum uh, to make, uh, to make food with, and it turned out really, really, really well. 
Um, and the last one um, that we're still trying to experiment with, and it's kind of tough because these are gigantic trees, is the shortleaf fig, uh, ficus citrifolia. This is one that, you know, is, it's, it's a ficus. It's, a, it's pretty aggressive. It'll grow like, you know, 40 feet tall, probably taller than that, um, actually. But it produces little tiny um, fig fruits. And each one of those is, you know, again, probably about the size of your pinky. Um, but I took, a pic I took that picture that you see on my screen you know, uh, yesterday. <laughs> um, and it's fruiting like crazy. And, and these are plants that we've just got in pots. So um, once we did have enough of these to, uh, to cook down into sort of like a, a jam, um, you know, just topped a, a little cracker with some goat cheese and this in the in the fig jam, it was absolutely phenomenal. And, and that's the thing with a lot of these plants is that they, they, they produce small fruits or, or, you know, their, their harvest is small, but they make, they just have such incredible flavors that, um, in my opinion, really rival or, or beat down in some cases, um, some of the cultivated um, types of fruits, just because it's that, it's that kind of like wild untapped flavor, um, you know, hasn't been bred for certain qualities it's just like that's the that's the one plant that nature intended and that's how it tastes and it's most of the time pretty darn good um and uh, i think the last uh plant that i'm going to go through are um we've got a few different native blueberries um this is the one uh that we like promoting because it's got a, a beautiful quality to the plant itself um you know it, it's very small the scrub blueberry it's a very small plant only grows to about three feet um, love sun it's got this beautiful like silvery green foliage and, and as the new growth emerges it's this um, light purple color uh, and it's absolutely beautiful um, great plant for the landscape but once it um, flowers in spring fruits in the summer uh, it's got these little tiny blueberries and it's and it's almost like you're, you're mixing a blueberry flavor with with like a hint of, of rose or rose water um, it's got this floral note that's just absolutely unparalleled and, you know, the problem is, is that because these plants don't grow so big, you know, you would need a few of them um, and go out there and, and fight the birds uh, for the berries, um, save enough in your freezer to be able to cook down and make a jam. But if anyone ever does this, they can email me back after they've done it and tell me how amazing it was because this is, I think, the single most uh, delicious native plant thing that we have ever made. It's, it's absolutely incredible. And I can't, I can't uh, 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 overstate that enough. Um, so yeah, you know, and we've definitely got pretty easy access to all these plants. But um, for the most part, all these plants are pretty easy to grow um, in a landscape setting. Some of these are pretty adaptable to, um, to container gardening as well, especially some of the smaller baseous plants. Um, the scrub blueberry, I potted one of those up uh, a few years ago in a pot, kept it on my patio until I realized that I had too much shade and it wasn't happy there. So, um, but a lot of these plants are very easy to keep um, in containers like you would normal vegetables or herbs or anything like that. So it's kind of a fun way to experiment with new flavors and, and try new things. Um, so I do have a few more that I have to go over because there is some misconception about are they native? Are they not native? Um, Everglades tomatoes, despite the name, are not native. Um, they are naturalized, so you could find them out in the wild um, if you went and looked in certain places, but uh, they make absolutely tasty fruits. They are just packed with tomato flavor. They've got a really, really uh, hard tang that hits you, and they're fantastic. I, I haven't had enough to, to make like a, a tomato sauce out of them, which I really wanted to do. Um, just seemed like as we were collecting these, um, you know, it's one of those plants that we kind of lost track of um, production wise. So we never really had enough, but once you've got these plants um, in your yard, it's definitely very easy because they reseed easily. Um, and they're just, they're just incredibly tasty, not native, but great for your garden. Um, and the other one is seminal pumpkin. Uh, again, not native, uh, naturalized. And I, I think a lot, you know, a lot fewer counties, but uh, even still a few counties, um, but they make great squashes. Um, this is something that we used in uh, a few of our demonstrations for our cooking uh, programs because, you know, they're a great squash. They've got great flavor and they've got pretty big, you know, they're pretty big fruits. So, you know, you get, you get a good amount of yield out of these things too. Um, so, uh, you know, now that I've rambled on about all the plants, um, I'm going to go through the fun stuff and show you 
uh, all the ideas, all the recipes that we've kind of uh, collected and, and gone through. So the first year, um, that first spring EcoFest, um, we did a few different um, things. We made uh, yopon teas, which are absolutely delicious. You know, you just grab a few leaves from your yopon, toast them or don't. You know, you can make a green tea out of them as well um, and then steep them. Um, but one of the other um, accompaniments I had for that was a uh, cream cheese uh, and herb spread. So that was just a little tiny chunk of, of homemade bread, of course. Everyone's got time for that now. Um, but homemade bread, um, and it was just a simple cream cheese that was whipped up with uh, the wild basil, dotted horse mint, uh, our meadow garlic, and bird pepper. Just blend it all up. And, and really, that one is something that everyone always asks me to make again, give me a recipe, uh, you know, make a bunch of it so that I can buy it in bulk. Um, because it really is something that when you combine all of these flavors, even in something as simple as cream cheese or butter or something like that, it really just layers on the flavor and makes anything uh, extreme uh, and delicious. So even just a little tiny piece of bread, um, it was it was definitely a hit. So if you've got any of these plants or are interested in growing any of these plants, I would tell you to get them, start growing them um, and make this once and you'll I, I think you'll definitely be hooked. Um, so we did that. Um, one of our good friends, Amanda Streets, um, uh, decided and, and heard our pleas that, uh, you know, every, every program before this, we would ask, all right, now if we have any other questions, we'll go over them. And if anyone wants to bring us 200 cocoa plums uh, to make this cocoa plum pudding, then we will absolutely do that. Uh, and she was the crazy person that decided to bring us 200 cocoa plums, like you can see there. Um, those are what the red tip cocoa plums look like. Um, so she brought them. Um, we managed to find one legitimate recipe for cocoa plum pudding using cocoa plums, um, and it, the recipe required 200 plums. So uh, eventually that kind of happened, and uh, these are pictures that Hillary took as she processed these. Essentially, you could just boil the bulk amount of fruits down, um, you know, with a little bit of sugar. She's got a cinnamon stick in there, too. Um, you would just boil them down so that the flesh kind of melded with, uh, you know, the flesh came off of the seed. Um, and then you would um, drain that um, to kind of make the pulp that you see in the middle picture. Um, and then that was mixed in with the rest of the batter for the pudding. And I should say that this is like a European style pudding. So kind of a cake, not exactly American pudding. Um, so, uh, you know, just mixed in the flesh with that and then um, baked it. And that's how the, the little bunt uh, pudding cake came out. And with the rest of the um, water, or the syrup kind of that was drained off from the pulp, um, she added a whole bunch more sugar, uh, a thickening agent, and made um, and made a, a syrup for it as well. And it was really, really good. Um, the the red tip cocoa plums definitely made the difference because they've got that um, more distinct like fruit flavor. It's not just sweetness. Um, so it, it made it was absolutely phenomenal. And since then, we have been asking anyone else that wants to bring us another two hundred cocoa plums that we will make you a pudding. So that offer is still on the table. Um, and of course, like I said, waste not, want not. So after she processed um, all the flesh and all the pulp out of the fruit, um, she then did the, went through the, the painstaking process of cracking open each and every nut off of those cocoa plums to get to, to, get to what was inside, toasted them in a dry pan, um, and then threw in some sugar um, and made a brittle out of it. And again, once you get inside the once you get inside the nut and actually get to that uh, edible part, it's 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 great. It's it's kind of like a, a mild hazelnut almost. Um, and it was fantastic, especially in the brittle. It was it was absolutely incredible. Uh, so you know, if you're crazy enough to go out in your yard and and harvest your cocoa plums. Uh, you can use every single piece of that, and every single piece of it is delicious. Um, so, of course, we've gone through and uh, processed our elder flowers since we've got our our bearing tree on the on the nursery property. So, um, this is one that you would essentially just steep the flowers in a simple syrup solution. Um, adding a few lemon slices really helps pull out um, all of the flavor with the acidity of it. Um, so you would just let that steep um, for like, I think we did about two to three days. 
on the countertop covered, um, let it steep, drain all the stuff out, and then um, you've got uh, you know an elderflower syrup. It's wonderfully fragrant. It's got a very nice floral quality to it. Um, we made lemonade with it. You know, simple lemon juice, uh, simple syrup, and water. Um, you could carbonate it as well if you wanted some like elderflower soda, something like that. Um, it's a little bit of work for these because you do want to be careful um, uh, of the stems. And you can see some green in there, and it's not the worst thing if you're steeping it. But when you're actually cooking it down like a, a, a beauty berry, or I'm sorry, a, an elderberry jam or jelly, you do kind of want to make sure that you're not getting too much of that in there because, you know, then you can start getting some stomach aches, some grumblies, and, you know, and, and start cursing at Davis and Hillary because they told you it was edible. Um, but, uh, Oh, I see Stefan's got a little uh, a fluorescence there. A little, uh, I'm sorry, uh, panicle. Stefan, is that the correct term? I'm, uh, yeah, it is a panicle. Actually, oh, actually, no. Um, it might be an umble. Um, it is an umble. But, uh, I'm sorry. It's definitely an umble. Yeah, oh. it's a great time to harvest them. It's an umbel. Okay, so it is an umbel. Uh, uh, that's the um, arrangement of the flowers. And um, also time to harvest them, and they're just, they're just incredible. Uh, and I was just going to say, lucky enough that I tried all those recipes that I just showed, and they were all amazing. So I can vouch for it. Actually, yeah. I'm uh, now that I, I think about, it, I'm pretty sure Stefan's been along for all of these different rides that we've been on. Uh, so uh, if anyone doubts any of the uh, any of the uh, uh, integrity of our experiments or or how these things actually turned out, uh, I've got I've got him uh, on the inside to vouch for me. <laughs> so um, with the um, with the um, cucumbers, uh, this is what I kind of devised. Um, uh, to, to do for this. And I think this was actually our, um, this was actually one of our, our, um, our hors d'oeuvres that we presented last year, um, for, um, for this chapter. Uh, so, uh, essentially we roasted, uh, I roasted a few, um, seminal pumpkins. Again, I know they're not native, but they're definitely tasty and we had them. So I had this idea of a crostini, um, a little, you know, bagel chip or whatever with a, uh, a base of, uh, herb spread, uh, a roasted vegetable and like uh, something pickled to add that kind of uh, briny saltiness uh, to the rest of everything. So I roasted some seminal pumpkin uh, with a few of the herbs. You would just I just tossed it with olive oil after I cut it up um, with some of the herbs uh, that we've mentioned before. Threw it in the oven um, and we had a few jars of our native pickles that I cut in half, um, kind of like a caper. You know, like a just that kind of briny saltiness. Um, and then on the base is a uh, an herbed uh, an herbed uh, butter. So that's you know again the herbs we mentioned before, um, fresher. They're not cooked down. Um, and then on top of a little uh, uh, a little like toasted bread chip. Um, and that one was fantastic as well. A uh, little uh, cute little hors d'oeuvre with uh, with the native plants. Um, and that one was definitely a favorite too. That was one of my favorites because uh, those pickles are I, I really understate them. And uh, maybe I'm just a little too proud of, of discovering it uh, here locally. But uh, I, I think definitely the appeal in, uh, you know, the, the size of them uh, is, definitely, is definitely something cool, too. But unfortunately, my delicious Christinis were overshadowed that day by Hillary's absolutely delicious uh, Beautyberry Fairy Cakes um, with candied violas. So... Um, we did a few experiments with our native violets in trying to candy the flowers, but they are so much more delicate than, um, you know, your non-native uh, violets. So um, I don't have the pictures in this PowerPoint, but uh, the pictures I had of her trying to, to candy them, they just came out looking like squashed bugs on a windshield and it wasn't really uh, appealing at all. So uh, after the fact, after that didn't really work out, um, she went back and, and candied some actual, um, uh, some of the, the non-native viola flowers, um, topped them up. Um, and um, she actually, um, instead of using, uh, instead of, uh, for her wet ingredients in the batter for the cake, 
um, she used elderflower, um, her elderflower syrup. So it didn't really shine through. Um, for something like that, you kind of have to, to um, apply or, or use in kind of a raw state because it is such a delicate flavor. But just to throw it out there, she did use it. Um, and inside of each one of the fairy cakes, uh, they were stuffed with um, beautyberry jelly. And they were absolutely killer. Um, she also used a little bit of the, uh, the liquid um, beautyberry uh, in the icing as well. And that kind of gave, uh, gave it the color there, the pinkish color. Um, they were absolutely delicious. I know that she loathed the, the whole process because start to finish, that took her way, way too much time. Um, but the second someone asked her, Hillary, would you do it again? She was like, yeah, yeah, okay, I would. Um, so maybe after she comes back from vacation, uh, someone can pop her the question and, and, and see, if, uh, see if she'll make some more uh, fairy cakes for everyone. Um, so yeah, just to name a few, there's definitely some other stuff that we've gone over and done. Um, a few other natives that we've used. Um, springtime is a little bit different. We definitely have a lot of, of emerging herbaceous plants um, that we'll like to use. We kind of look more towards like the fresher flavors. Um, definitely try and cut out a lot of the sugar uh, during that season, you know, because we got to save it for the summer. Um, but it's it's kind of all about really getting out there, figuring out what you've got in your yard or what you would like to plant in your yard um, and, and finding those added benefits. You know, um, I'll always add the disclaimer that you do need to be sure of what you're eating. Uh, make sure what you have is identified as such and you're not eating plants that you're not sure of. Um, you know, I, Wilcox Nursery or Davis Burkett Enterprises is not responsible for any uh, harm, any stomach aches, upset bellies uh, that you may incur. Um, but it's, it's a really fun uh, outlet, uh, creative outlet for us uh, when we like, you know, cooking, we like doing all these different things um, and being able to, to express uh, kind of a, a mashup, a love between uh, native plants and in the culinary world. And, and uh, you know, it's something that I haven't seen a lot of people do. Uh, so I definitely feel very proud uh, to be able to, uh, to take part in it and, uh, and uh, kind of spread awareness for uh, not just growing plants for the wildlife, but for you too. So. Um, Thank you. Uh, David, that was, uh, that was awesome. Um, you know, and I just wanted to uh, um, uh, thank you and and for coming on this uh, this journey that you that you done kind of bring it you know there's people that have written books about if you're trapped in the forest you can eat bark until someone rescues you or something like that but you're kind of taking it saying that these things are are delicious in their own right and can be uh, elevated to um, a really uh, um, uh, almost like you know fancy fancy level but but can just be really good on their own so um i want to open it up to questions for everybody but we have a couple of questions um so uh ginger asked and you know we could go really dive deep on you know the the stopper berries and marl berry and snow berry and all these berries have some sort of ability to them and there's so many different things but um, Ginger was specifically asking about any of the passion flower species we have because passion fruit is so popular that the Passiflora uh, edulis, I believe, is the one that people are used to uh, eating. Um, have you tried any of our native um, passion fruits? Yeah, definitely, I have. Um, uh, the uh, Definitely uh, the uh, Passiflora incarnata, our, our native uh, maypop, is definitely the most edible i think of all the ones that i've tried um uh i i have not eaten um uh i'm forgetting the species our corky stem passion flower not tried eating those little tiny berries um i usually leave those ones for the birds but um and also the uh, the white may pop the passiflora palins that south florida species um I would stay away from the latter two. Uh, I've not, I haven't tried uh, the corky stem, but the uh, white passion flower kind of tastes like uh, uh, Dawn dish soap. It's not good. Um, and I'm pretty sure I've eaten it, you know, when it's not ripe, when it is ripe, and it doesn't make a difference. Um, but the, um, but the May Pops actually do taste very good. Um, when they are ripe, um, they don't have that 
quite that kind of goopy yellow consistency and color like the uh, the Passiflora edulis, the the um, like the commonly cultivated edible passion fruit. Um, but they do have a really nice sweet like tropical flavor. Um, each one of those little seeds is kind of, uh, and there's a whole bunch inside of the fruit, um, is kind of coated in like a, a sweet flesh that you can kind of just pop it all in your mouth um, and eat like that. Or if you're able to, to, to gather enough of the fruits, I'm sure you could, you know, do jellies or jams uh, or, you know, look into preservation. But um, if you've got may pop fruits that, you know, have not yet popped um, and you're interested in trying it, they definitely taste very, very good. Um, so cool. that's something I would recommend. Awesome. Um, and someone did comment that corky stem passion fruit, which is like, a tenth the size of a grape uh, does not taste like anything. So uh, good for you uh, uh, for uh, sorry to actually go find uh, some corky stem passion uh, fruit before the birds got them. Um, and uh, I had a couple questions about uh, what's called ground nut, ground cherry, uh, tomatillo, native tomatillo, physalis. Um, it grows in coastal areas very, very well if you need a salt tolerant plant. Have you tried any of those? Um, we had, uh, yeah, we have, we, we've brought some of those in. Um, I can't remember the species offhand. Um, uh, but we did, uh, we did try a few experiments with them. Um, and the problem that we found is that they didn't have a very like distinct flavor when they were ripe, they were kind of sweet. Um, but there wasn't a whole lot of like, uh, tomato flavor or, toma or, or like a to uh, tomatillo flavor. It was just kind of like a kind of sweet thing. Um, uh, we were thinking about, you know, kind of trying to replicate like a tomatillo salsa um, with some of that, some bird pepper and some other herbs. Um, one, we never really got production going well enough. Um, you know, in our few trial runs when we had ripe fruit, uh, when we would try them, you know, we we weren't really taken with the flavor of the fruit. Um, I know they're definitely edible and you can, uh, you can partake, but um, that's something that we kind of lost interest in after uh, a little bit of trial and error. Um, might be something we pick up again. You know, uh, I don't know if we have to process them in a certain way to, to bring out a certain flavor. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it is something that we sell at the nursery uh, off and on. And I'm pretty sure right now we've got maybe a handful left. Um, but yeah, definitely edible, but uh, haven't used them quite as much. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure there's so many things you guys could uh, potentially be using. Um, I did have someone ask, which I think is, uh, is pretty interesting, about uh, tiger nut. And I said, what is tiger nut? Davis, do you know what tiger nut is? I'm not familiar with tiger nut. Um, so I had to do a quick uh, search, and it's actually yellow nut sedge which uh, oh. if you have done, um, you know, maintenance, uh, you know, I, Davis, you have, but uh, getting rid of nut sedge is uh, very difficult and time consuming, but uh, the actual nut of the yellow nut sedge is also called a uh, tiger nut. Um, so there you go. I mean, uh, we haven't even gone down to the weeds yet. So uh, that's something that uh, I did not know. Yeah. And that's, that's something that, that we try to like define is like, you know, there are also weeds and, and stuff like that that you could go eat, you go eat Spanish needle, um, you know, uh, supposedly the yellow nut sedge and some other stuff. Um, we try to keep it in line with like what you could also plant as a, you know, a, a typical landscape plant. Um, some mm -hmm. people are growing the, the Spanish needle as a legitimate landscape plant for the wildlife benefit. Um, but uh, for us, you know, we tried to keep it with like stuff that we've got in pots at the nursery and then like a few other extras. Um, but that's something interesting. That's something we might look into uh, is, is that. Um, I wonder what kind of yeah. uh, flavor that thing has. I mean, I think vitamins you'll eventually get in your yard anyway. Um, but yeah, I've, I've had it in some salads actually. Um, uh, oh. Mallory will make it in a nice salad. Yeah, the younger leaves. But we also mm -hmm. had uh, Suzanne ask about, because I did mention marlberry which I have seen people eat before. I've tasted it myself, um, mm -hmm. just a few. Um, have you ever tried marlberry or did you ever consider that one at all? Yeah, um, we, I have tried marlberry and I think it actually is a pretty um, distinct flavor. Um, the one thing, the one kind of roadblock that I found uh, in like my early testing, my scientific method is, uh, <laughs> 
is that, uh, you know, they are small fruits and uh, a good portion of it are seeds and the seeds are pretty bitter. They've got a lot of like tannin in it or something that kind of goes through the mouth. So um, I was working, um, I was in contact with a, a local, uh, a local couple that make um, YouTube videos and um, had worked with them on getting some natives into their yard so that they could kind of incorporate it into um into their videos um they make a lot of wine um and ales meats and stuff like that um and i talked to them and they were interested in trying out using the um using the marl berries to make a wine and i thought that was really cool um i did kind of lose touch with them so i'm not sure where that is in the process if they've tried it if they've had success with it um but uh, it's definitely something I think has, has some validity to it. I think the fruits taste really good. If you can just kind of like bite into one and work your way around the seeds without, without crushing them and kind of getting all that bitterness um, across your palate, I think they're really good. And, and I think that's something that this year, now that we've gone through kind of what we have already, we're going to start looking for stuff like that. Um, some of the other berries. That's great. Yeah. Well, we're all looking forward to trying the Marlberry wine, maybe some stopper mead or something, but uh <laughs> Um, so, uh, Katie had a good point, um, about people who have pet birds, which would probably translate over to, uh, birds out in wild, but she said that, uh, the pets, uh, like the tomatillos from the store, so she was considering growing our native physalis to potentially feed to her, uh, pet bird, um, but that would also probably mean that it's a good food source for birds, and then, um, Janet mentioned that the tomatillos should be very ripe. So don't eat them. Usually anything that's green, you know, plants will have defense mechanisms. They don't want to be eaten until they're ready to be eaten. So you should probably never eat anything that isn't ripe anyway, but Jan mentioned that. So that's a, um, that's a really good point. And um, Davis, I was just, I was curious, you know, as you're going through all these different uh, native plants and, you know, everybody knows about all the problems we're having with, um, with citrus, I mean, is it crazy to think that one day you'll be the baron of a 10,000 acre cocoa plum plantation somewhere? No, I mean, you know, uh, me and Hillary have already run through scenarios where, you know, the apocalypse happens and people are, are, are throwing like bottle caps at each other as currency mm -hmm. and they're trying to fight for the last like morsel of, of canned tuna and what we've decided is that we would, um, you know, find a plot of land um, in secret that we would plant with all of these plants and then um, basically rule all of Pinellas or the world because we have, yeah, yeah we were prepared. Yeah. Well, uh, Davis, that went down a dark road very fast. I appreciate what? that. Um, what did I say? Uh, so I like but, blacked out for a second. Do you think that it's actually a... A uh, commercial uh, one day, a commercial uh, um, industry potentially for something that's actually big, like a really big cocoa plum, if they could breed varieties that actually have more flesh on or something like that. I mean, especially an edible nut as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's something that, you know, I think we only tried once, um, uh, you know, processing wise, because uh, we were, you know, we don't ever get enough fruits on um, you know, potted plants in the nursery, much less, um, the few specimens that we actually have on the, on the property. Um, so the one time that we were really able to buckle down and, and go through a recipe, uh, I think it turned out really, really good. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's something that, you know, if more, if, if, if more people, you know, start to pay attention to stuff like this, that they can, they can really start, um, introducing, yeah, more, um, cultivated varieties of like, all right, well now we're growing cocoa plums for fruit production, uh, and, and other things like that. But even, even as is, if you've got, you know, a hedgerow of cocoa plum, that's, I think that's plenty of plants to produce enough fruit that you could make a cake or you can make brittle or, you know, uh, you know, whatever you really wanted to do. That's awesome. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Deborah. Um, and again, yeah, everybody's saying, you know, thank you very much. But uh, do you see any recipe book potentially um, that you <laughs> and, and Hillary could put together and maybe I can be the editor, the food taster for something like that? <laughs> You're just trying to get in on this, man. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've definitely talked about doing a sort of recipe book. I mean, maybe a loose recipe book 
Um, if we've got the time to really sit down and actually um, produce legitimate recipes, it's, it's, it's the only problem really with making is that we want, we would want to make legitimate cookbook or recipe book if we did this, which means we would want to do trial and error, make sure that the recipes are as good as possible, you know, test a few different quantities of this or that. Um, you know, as far as, as promoting the certain types of plants and how they can be used in a very, you know, in a kind of general sense, uh, like, you know, like I've done tonight, um, I think is a good starting point because then people can sort of start to experiment for themselves. But it is something we've talked about, I think, since, since that first uh, presentation is coming up with some kind of cookbook or even just, or even just like a more detailed version of something like this. Um, that we can hand out to people and say like, hey, did you know, go try it, you know. Well, you would have a lot of supporters. Um, and again, I just want to thank, uh, thank uh, Davis for, for coming out here and doing this awesome presentation. And